Apparently, uh, they got a lot of wind down in Louisiana as well, just like we did, so that weather patterns are changing. Um, so if you have just joined us here at NBC, uh, Pastor Chad was here for a number of years. He helped to lead worship amongst many other things, and uh, he actually was on the, uh, the ground floor of planning the whole Underground Sessions idea, and so it's kind of cool to have him come back and, and see how we've grown in that, in that avenue. So uh, again, topic is the future of humanity and technology. We, we really hope you come out. Please, please, please register online. Um, we just would love to see you there and, uh, and invite a friend, whether they're a Christian or not. It's, uh, it's certainly a topic that applies to everyone. So, so we do hope to see you on March 16th, 6.30 p.m. Um, and before we dive into God's Word this morning, let's pray. Would you play with, pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your goodness, your grace. Lord, we thank you for the gospel and that Jesus is who he said he is. And so this morning, as we look at your word, I pray that you would challenge our hearts, that you would uh, uh, poke us and prod us, Lord, that we would move into a deeper relationship with you, or if we haven't even started a relationship, that we would, we would begin that even today, Lord. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and speak during this time, and we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the year was 1986. It was uh, a memorable year because New York Met fans will remember that's the last year that your team won the World Series. <clears throat> the place was Middletown, New Jersey, and the people were my parents. See, my sister had just been born, and they decided they were going to build their own house as they were expanding their family. Now, my father wasn't an expert builder, but my uncle worked in construction, and together, with the help of my uncle's crew, they decided to build a new house, brick by brick, beam by beam. I remember watching as the frames went up that looked a little bit like this. The uh, pictures have come a long way since 1986, but just bear with me. The floors were there as well, and then after a few months, the roof went on. It was really cool just to watch it, and then eventually, as it was completed, it looked like this. This was the house that I, I grew up in. Now, again, I have to admit, it was pretty cool to watch your childhood home being built, and I, I as, a, as a little four-year-old, could not wait to move into this new place. And so I would go to the construction site, I would watch what was happening, um, and the thing just that intrigued me the most out of this whole process was the ditches they dug in the ground. In fact, here's me sitting in the ditches just before they put the, the concrete in. Um, uh, the, it, was, it was just cool. I, I would run through these things like they were a maze, right? Like I was like a little hamster in a maze that I was going through there. It was, it was cool. Um, but this all led to a very memorable moment from my childhood because one day they started to pour concrete in these trenches, they had to form the foundation. And so as a curious child, I wanted to know what concrete felt like. And so as they were pouring it in, I decided I was going to jump in because actually I think I was really upset I couldn't run through them anymore. But I jumped in, and uh, I didn't realize this was a bad thing until I heard my dad running over saying, what are you doing? Quickly pulled me out, had to drag the, the, the shoes and the socks off of my feet until before the concrete hardened. Apparently, my mom got rid of all the pictures so I couldn't be incriminated because I couldn't find those. <laughs> but it was that moment that my dad explained to me the importance of the foundation to the whole house. He said this to me. He said, the foundation has to be right, Bob. If the foundation isn't firm, if it isn't sturdy, the house will never stand. And if your own house has foundational issues, I think you know this to be true. And if your house, house doesn't have that, count yourself blessed uh, and you've probably likely taken it for granted. See, the foundation has to be right. The difference between a good and a bad foundation is a house that lasts. However, if you look at our world, and many times our own lives, we tend to build on shaky foundations. And this is the tension that we live with. We rarely think that the foundations we're building on are shaky. I mean, let's stick with this housing example for just a second. Um, it was not too long ago that the entire country plunged into what's now called the Great Recession. Why? Well, people bought houses they couldn't afford. And even if the foundation of the house was secure, the mortgages they signed up for were not. And so as a result, people's financial foundation collapsed. They defaulted on their homes or they went underwater in a loan. But what was the prevailing belief? A house is a safe investment, and it will always go up in value. That was the foundation, right? We didn't expect the foundation to collapse. And really the same is true in other areas of our lives. 
I mean, I mean, just stop for a second and think about all the foundations you're building your life on. Are they sturdy or are they shaky? Now, you may say, well, I was wise in the housing market in 2008. I, I didn't buy a home I couldn't afford. But what about other areas of your life? Remember, we rarely think that the foundation is shaky. What do I mean? Well, let me, let's take health, for example, your health. How often do you think about your health failing? Now, some of you are saying, well, I think about that a lot. Um, but how often did you think about that before you got diagnosed or you got sick? I mean, especially when you're young, you always think you're going to get a good report, right? You're invincible. Maybe you're banking, on, banking everything on your health, as long as your healthy life is good, right? Uh, but no matter what you do, here's the reality. One day, you're going to die, you're going to get sick, and that foundation is going to collapse, or maybe you are, you're responsible with your money and you're building your whole life on a, a foundation of financial security. But you never consider that you might lose your job mid-career or that the market will crash or that you can't work anymore. And in the end, as the old play puts it, you can't take it with you. And that foundation isn't going to last into eternity. Maybe your foundation is education and knowledge. But there's always going to be something you won't know, and I have to tell you, one day your mind is going to go. <laughs> you're going to stop remembering key details. Maybe you're already experiencing that. I, I think I feel that a little bit too. Uh, the foundation, that foundation will one day collapse. Or maybe your family is your foundation. Your family is your whole life, and you assume they will always be there. But then somebody dies, or they let you down, and your firm foundation starts to feel like a house of cards. Or if you're younger, uh, maybe you're building your identity and your worth on your Instagram followers or your Snapchat streaks. But what happens if somebody stops commenting on your photos or your hot streak ends? You see, these foundations look sturdy until they're not. And as my father once wisely told me, the foundation has to be right. Because when you build on the wrong foundation, Eventually, it's going to collapse, like that house of cards. And then you're left picking up the rubble, wondering, what do I do next? Well, today I want to talk with you about a foundation that will never crack, a foundation that will hold strong even if the wind howls like it did this week. That was pretty, pretty crazy, right? To discover that sure foundation, we need to know the master builder. You see, all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, people have been asking the question, who is Jesus? And so today's passage in Matthew 16, 13 to 23, it is no different. In fact, it may be the central passage in the whole book about Jesus' identity. And the passage presents us with three questions about that identity. Jesus says, well, what does the world say? And then he says, what do you say? And then finally, we'll see, what does Jesus say? What does the world say? What do you say? And what does Jesus say? Well, point one, what does the world say? See, in this series, we've been looking at the life of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, and Jesus has confronted religious leaders. He's told stories. He's performed miracles. He's cast out demons. He's even walked on the water, right? As you can imagine, there is a buzz about Jesus. People are asking, who is this guy? Uh, how can he do these things? Is he a threat? And as we get into the central section of Matthew's gospel, Jesus and his disciples move into this new region. In verse 13, it says this. He says, um, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, his disciples, he asked his disciples, what do people say that the Son of Man is? What do people say that the Son of Man is? In other words, Jesus is asking his disciples, what are people out here saying about me? Which seems a little odd for Jesus to ask because shouldn't Jesus already know what people are thinking? Jesus is not trying to work on his brand appeal, no. What is, so what is he doing? Well, I think to answer this question, let's talk just quickly about some cultural background of this scene. See, Caesarea Philippi is about 20 miles to the north of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus and his disciples had just come from. And that, this area in Caesarea Philippi is mainly a Gentile area. It's at the foothills of Mount Hermon near the source of the Jordan River. 
The city was built by a guy named Herod Philip and was named in honor of the emperor Caesar Augustus, that's Caesarea Philippi. Now, because it was a Gentile area, it also brought with it Gentile customs and Gentile religions. In fact, the area had long been a place where there was worship for the god Baal. Uh, additionally, there was a shrine nearby for a Greek god named Pan, which is actually still there today. In fact, I want to I show you an image. Um, my friends Rick and Kathy Splinter actually just traveled to Israel recently, and I happened to run into them Wednesday night, and they, they said they had like 5,000 pictures for their trip. So I can only pick two, but um, they're good ones. You'll notice in this picture there's, there's a, a description of Pan and his, his temple there, as well as some doors that are in the side of the mountain. And each of those doors represent a cave that was a shrine to a pagan god. So picture this scene here. Jesus takes his followers to a place known for the worship of pagan gods. And then he asks them the question, what are these people saying about me? And at the foot of the mountain where all these pagan shrines are, Jesus wants to know what the pagans are saying, and the disciples respond to verse 14. They say this, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So what all these people are thinking here is that Jesus is some dead guy who's come back to life. So some say John the Baptist. Well, that's interesting because Herod Philip, or he was also called Philip the Tetrarch, ruled the region for 37 years, and he was married to a woman named Salome. Now, that might not mean much to you, but she happened to be the girl who danced at the infamous scene where John the Baptist was beheaded. So there's some history there. And in, in fact, her father was Herod Antipas, uh, who killed John the Baptist, and then he believed and started a rumor that Jesus was, in fact, John the Baptist come back to life, and it became really popular. Others say Jesus was Elijah, because they believed Elijah was a messianic forerunner in the Old Testament. He was a prophet, like Jeremiah. In fact, each of these responses indicate a prophet which was in line with the popular expectations of Messiah's coming. It goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 18, where Moses offered a prophecy about a great and final prophet who would come. Now, what's really interesting about this is this was happening, yes, but it didn't just happen in the first century, no. No, this is still happening today. There were rumors about who Jesus was in his day, but there are also modern rumors every day, every year about Jesus. Who was he? Was he a great teacher? Did he, did he really rise from the dead? And just like Jesus asked his first followers, who do these people say I am? He looks at us, his followers today, and he says, what does the world say? What are the modern rumors about me? Because popular culture isn't at a loss for commentary about Jesus. I mean, the issues of our day many times revolve around religious liberty, See, secular people don't like symbols that remind us of Jesus. In fact, there's a 2017 case uh, that was before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. It's now before the Supreme Court um, to rule on the Bladensburg Peace Cross Memorial from World War I in Bladensburg, Maryland. The contention was that it violated the First Amendment Establishment Clause. Why? Because a cross could symbolize the establishment of religion. And so underneath that case is a belief about Jesus. These rumors have crept into the minds of Americans. In fact, the Barna Group did a recent study regarding Americans' beliefs about Jesus, and here's what they discovered. It said 90% of Americans believe that Jesus was a real historical person. Okay, 10% don't. Younger generations are less likely to believe that Jesus was God at 48%. Americans in general are divided on whether Jesus was sinless at 52%. And finally, people are conflicted between Jesus and good deeds as a way to salvation. Now, in interpreting this study, Barna President David Kinnaman offered these words. He said, these findings demonstrate the strong degree to which Jesus remains embedded in the minds of Americans. However, it's clear that while Jesus is in our minds, Americans' commitment to him is a mile wide and an inch deep. It's not hard to find people using Jesus as a source of authority to get their point across, whether it's politically or otherwise. 
If you listen closely, though, you'll find it's very clear that many people cite Jesus without having read much of what he said. And so these beliefs are based on rumors, on their own preconceived notions. In his book with author Sky Jitani, um, tell us about a test that one professor gives college students every year, the incoming college students. He says the test begins with a series of questions about what the students think Jesus is like. So it's questions like, was Jesus moody? Uh, does Jesus get nervous? Is Jesus the life of the party or is he an introvert? And so these 24 questions are then followed by a second set with some slightly altered language in which the students answer questions about their own personalities. The exam has been field tested by many professionals, but the results are remarkably consistent. Everyone thinks Jesus is just like them. Everyone thinks Jesus is just like them. But is that true? I mean, Jesus said he was, said he was God, right? What is the world saying about Jesus, and have you believed any of it? You know, too often I hear that first-year college students will go to university and start losing their faith. Why? Oftentimes I hear professors attack their Christian belief, and the student wasn't prepared to answer questions, and their foundation wasn't sturdy. See, again, we have to be careful to believe what other people were saying about Jesus without reading what Jesus said about himself. So test people. Test, test me, the preacher today. See, I pray the Lord would give me the insight, the wisdom, the boldness to communicate his words accurately, but I always remember what my father said. The foundation has to be right. Because if the foundation isn't right, one day it's going to collapse. And remember, we never think the foundation is shaky until it collapses. Chris Pratt is a leading actor in Hollywood. He's been in high-profile movies like Jurassic World and Guardians of the Galaxy. In fact, if there's one place replete with people building their lives on faulty foundations, it's probably Hollywood. Whether it's wealth, fame, sexual exploits, drug addiction, beauty, it seems weekly we hear stories of people in Hollywood who are in rehab because their lives have collapsed. Now, what you might not know about Chris Pratt is that despite his fame, he's a Christian, and he won an award at the MTV Movie Awards last year. And he gave a really crafty speech where he managed to weave the gospel implicitly into his comments. And in so doing, what he, what he was accomplishing was challenging the foundations people were building their lives on. Here's how he concluded the speech. He said this, nobody is perfect. People are going to tell you you're perfect just the way you are. You're not. You are imperfect. You always will be. But there's a powerful force that designed you that way, and if you're willing to accept that, you will have grace. And grace is a gift. And like the freedom that we enjoy in this country, that grace was paid for with someone else's blood. Do not forget it. Don't take it for granted. Now, what Chris Pratt was saying to a whole bunch of people building their lives on a faulty foundation was this, that Jesus Christ is real that he is the foundation stronger than any other. So church, the foundation has to be right. What is your foundation? That's where Jesus turns next. First, he asks what the world is saying, but then he turns around to his disciples and asks, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? In other words, what are you saying about me? Now again, picture this scene. See, as I mentioned earlier, many commentaries think this is the center of Matthew's gospel. Up until this point, the disciples have been following Jesus. Yes, they probably have caught an inkling that he's the Messiah, but he hasn't called them on the carpet until now. And don't you see the irony again in this scene? Jesus takes his followers to this place filled with shrines to pagan gods. And it's here that he chooses to ask them this question who do you say that I am? He says, I've heard the rumors that other people have said. I know what the world says, but you are my followers, and I have to know, what do you say? And church, this is our lives every single day. Just like the disciples were surrounded by shrines to false gods, so are we. Our hearts can be pulled in so many different directions 
trying to get us to embrace the idols of success and security and fame. But Jesus looks at us and asks us the same question. What do you say? What foundation are you building on? Now, you may remember that last week, Pastor Dave challenged us with a very famous story with Peter walking on the water. When Jesus commanded the disciples to come out onto the water with him, who was it that stepped out? It was Peter. And now... We get to the key moment in the gospel, the big reveal. This right here is a bigger moment than any new launch of an Apple product or any final trailer of a blockbuster movie. Matthew has been leading us to this point all throughout his gospel. This is the climax before the cross. Everyone wants to know, who is Jesus? And when he asks that question, everyone holds their breath. In fact, I imagine the angels in heaven stopping and, and, and listening in. And it's here again that Peter breaks the silence. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah. And in the midst of all these shrines to false gods, this foundational truth pierces through Peter's words. This is the hinge of the gospel narrative at this point because up until now, Jesus has been labeled Christ, mostly in, in editorial comments, but never, listen to this, never have his disciples called him this in the gospel. He's been called the Son of God by demons. Even his disciples have said that, but this is different here. The reason Jesus takes them to Caesarea Philippi in the middle of the false gods is to settle once and for all where they stand. Jesus says, cast your vote. And Peter steps forward and speaks for the disciples. You are Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, that extended title, Son of the living God, is very Jewish. It had overtones of the king coming from the Davidic line. In fact, commentator Grant Osborne notes that this conversation becomes radically different once Peter speaks this confession. Before, they were talking about rumors about Jesus, linking him to various prophets, for Peter and the other 12 disciples, they may have thought Jesus was this or maybe that he was a forerunner to Messiah, but Jesus is saying here that's not enough. It's not enough to connect Jesus to a prophetic expectation generally. The disciples must give an account for who they understand Jesus to be. And Peter says, yes, you are Messiah. In fact, Peter does the same thing in John's gospel. At the end of John chapter 6, uh, Jesus is offering some hard teaching to his disciples. And so some people who claim to be his disciples walk away. And Peter turns, uh, Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, do you want to go away too? And Peter says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. Lord, to whom shall we go? There is no other foundation that we can build our lives on. You have the words of eternal life. And we're hanging on every word that you speak, Jesus. Is that the cry of your heart today as well? Because to everyone listening to this today, you need to understand the same is true for us. It's not enough to say we believe in God generally. We must be clear about who Jesus is and who we believe him to be. He's the Christ. Is he the Christ, the son of the living God? Because one day we'll stand before him and give an account. However, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, it should change the way that you live. His words change our hearts. In fact, author, uh, author and pastor Ray Ortland offers this illustration. This is what he says. He says, you and I are not integrated, unified persons. He says our hearts are multi-divided. It's like we have a boardroom in, 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 in every heart. Imagine that there's a big table, that there's leather chairs, there's coffee, bottled water, a whiteboard, a screen. A committee sits around the table of our hearts. There's a social self. There's a private self. Uh, there's a work self, a recreational self, a religious self, and there's a lot of others, I'm sure. See, the committee in your heart is arguing, they're debating, they're voting, constantly agitated and upset. Rarely can they come to one unanimous, wholehearted decision. We tell ourselves we're this way because we're so busy, 
and we have so many responsibilities. But the truth is, we're just divided, unfocused, hesitant, and unfree. Now, listen, this is what Ray Orland says. He says, that kind of person can accept Jesus in two ways. One way is to invite Jesus onto the committee. You give him a vote, too. But then it just becomes more complicated, right? The other way to accept Jesus, he says, is to say this, to say, Jesus, my life isn't working. Please come in and fire my committee. Every last one of them, I hand myself over to you. I am your responsibility now. Please run my whole life. And then he concludes with this. He says, accepting Jesus is not about adding Jesus. It's about subtracting idols. Now, when we confess, like Peter, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, it should change every aspect of how we live because our allegiance is first and foremost to him. It changes the way we think about life and death, about family, about our dating lives, about our, our finances and our career. When we confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we begin building our lives on a foundation that cannot be shaken. Now, if you are familiar with building houses and how that works, you know that, that, that uh, the trenches that I was in, eventually concrete gets poured in, and they call that a footing. But on top of the footing, what they start to do is put uh, cinder blocks like these. They start to form the foundation of the house, and they lock the blocks together so that the foundation is really secure. And so when we, start, when we confess that Jesus is Lord, what we're doing is we're placing our hope on a stronger, better foundation. No longer are we building our lives on something that's broken and shaky and that's going to collapse one day. No, the foundation has been replaced with a new one, a better one, an eternal one. When you build your life on Jesus, the foundation will never fail. Even if a microburst of wind comes through our area, even if an earthquake comes in your life, the foundation cannot be shaken. As my father said, the foundation has to be right. So what do you say? Who is Jesus? It's a question everyone has to answer. Is he merely a rumored prophet, a good moral teacher, a brilliant storyteller? Or is he the Christ, the Son of the living God? The answer to that question changes everything, and it allows us to hear our final point. What does Jesus say? Because knowing Jesus means that we're able to hear his voice. See, Jesus asked Peter to confess his belief, but then, then Jesus turns around and speaks to him. And he says this, he says, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, or Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, this is the first of three pronouncements that Jesus makes to Peter. Because of his confession, first, Jesus says he is blessed, and that's the Greek word makarios, which doesn't mean human happiness. It means divine favor. In other words, when we say someone is blessed, we are not talking about their countenance. <laughs> we are talking about an external person or circumstance that has conferred favor on that person. So Jesus says here, Peter is blessed because his Father in heaven revealed this truth to him. It's the same word used in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. And again, the same is true for us. If we know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are blessed. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He acknowledges that Peter is blessed, but then he takes it a step further and he speaks about his identity. He says this, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, does anyone, or I should say some people in here, know what their name means? See, when I was younger, I was fascinated by this. In fact, I looked up the etymology of my name and found out that Robert or Bob means, means something like bright fame. And when we were choosing names for our daughter, I found out Jenna means God is gracious. The Greek for Peter is Petros, which means rock. So literally, 
This phrase is saying, you are rock, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, I have to offer a brief uh, explanation here because this verse and the one that follows it has caused a lot of ink to be spilt over the years. Um, because if you have a Roman Catholic background, you know that this is the verse that people will point to to say that Peter was the first pope. In the Roman Catholic view, Peter became the bishop of Rome, and the keys of the kingdom in verse 19 are the papal authority that's passed down from pope to pope. Now, here at NBC, we, we wouldn't agree with that position. But even if you disagree with that view, there are some interpretive challenges here, and it centers around that second phrase on this rock, because the question is, well, who is or what is this rock? <clears throat> the question arises because there's two different Greek words. The Greek word for Peter is Petros, and the Greek word for this rock is Petra. There's a change in the emphasis of the, word, of the, of the verb. A Roman Catholic would argue that the rock is Peter. In the Protestant view, there's three options. First, some have argued that this rock is still Peter, even though we would disagree, they would disagree that he is the first pope. Instead, it's argued that Peter played a foundational role in the beginning of the church. Because his, beyond his confession here, Peter preaches at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Thousands of people come to know the Lord. He's instrumental in bringing the gospel to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, as well as the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. But when you get to Acts chapter 16, Peter fades away and Paul takes center stage. In other words, the church was built on Peter's ministry at the beginning, is the, is the view. Well, that view has some compelling features, but I would argue that the central theme of this passage here is the identity of Jesus. As such, this rock is actually pointing away from Peter to either Christ or the confession of Christ that Peter made. If, if Jesus was referring to Peter, he probably would have used um, Petros a second time. So the question becomes, does this rock refer to Christ himself, as Augustine and others argued, or Peter's confession in verse 16? Given the context, I think that this rock refers to the common confession made by all who are a part of the church, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I think that view makes best sense in the context. But remember our scene again here. Jesus has taken his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, an area where there's an abundance of shrines built to these pagan gods, and it's here that in amidst these false gods, false gods, he asks for a confession and where his disciples stand. And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, on that truth, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, this is a really powerful image here as well, because uh, there's actually a place in Caesarea Philippi called the gates of hell. Again, I stole pictures from the splinters. They have more. Um, but it looks like this. Scholars believe this was a shrine to the false god Baal, and it was common for worshipers of Baal to sacrifice children and throw them into this cave, which earned it the name the gates of hell because it's a place of death. And so Jesus takes his disciples to this place, and immediately after Peter makes his confession, Jesus affirms Peter's identity. He says, you are Petros, the rock. Yes, you're going to have a foundational role in the building and spreading of the gospel, but it's on the foundational truth that I am the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that I will build my church. It is on this rock that I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it because they represent death, but I bring life. Church, the foundation has to be right. Can you say that with me? The foundation has to be right. See, Messiah has come. The Savior is here. All the rumors that have been spreading, they're an echo of the truth. And from here on out in the, in the, in the, the Gospel of Matthew, the mission is clear. Because you see, many times uh, we think that Satan and his legions are always attacking us, like we're getting attacked by Satan. But notice here that he uses the phrase gates of hell. And gates are a defensive weapon. So what Jesus is about to tell us is that the best defense is a good offense. That when we spread the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, not only is our foundation secure, but we keep building the church brick by brick as we push back the darkness. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. Why? Because Jesus has given us the keys 
Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so listen closely to that, because Jesus has given us the keys to the kingdom. Now, in the ancient world, keys symbolized the power and access to open doors into the heavenly realms. If you lived in a palace, the keys were very large, and an an important official would carry them. Notice that Jesus says this again immediately after Peter's confession. In other words, the confession was the key to open the door for others to believe. Keys open and close doors. And when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, he rightly uses the keys, and we see from later in his ministry in Acts that he continues to use the keys. And so for us as followers of Christ, we don't open or close the door on our own authority, but we speak for the Lord when we say, believe on the Lord Jesus and the door to eternal life will be open to you. Reject him and the way will be closed. See, when Jesus speaks of binding and loosing, he's getting at the same concept. He says, we do not determine who enters heaven and who is shut out, what has been bound or loosed. If someone accepts Christ, they're loosed. If someone rejects Christ, they're bound. We are simply called to spread the message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And as we do so, lives are changed, the gates of hell are pushed pushed back. Now, the last verse of this section is a really peculiar one because after saying all this to his disciples, Jesus concludes with this. He says, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he's the Christ. And you say, hold on a second, wait, Did, didn't Peter just confess that Jesus was the Christ? And didn't he say that he was going to build his church? And didn't he give us the keys of the kingdom? Well, yeah, but remember, this is only the turning point of Matthew's gospel. Jesus hasn't gone to the cross yet. The mission is not yet complete, so his disciples had to wait. And that was hard for them, especially Peter. Because in the next scene in Matthew 16, Jesus begins to predict his death and point his disciples to the cross, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day, be raised. Now, this is the first of several predictions of his death in Matthew, Because now that his identity has been revealed, Jesus starts revealing his mission. Because without his sacrifice, the doors can't be opened. And Peter, who's just made this foundational confession of the church, who found the keys to the kingdom, is enraged by this. He goes up to Jesus and and he rebukes Jesus. Let me say that again. Peter goes and rebukes Jesus. Now, do you know how much audacity you have to have to rebuke Jesus? (laughs) And what does Jesus say to him? He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Wow. Now, Peter, the man who played a foundational role in building the church, Jesus calls him Satan. He says, you're not setting your mind on the things of God. Uh, Peter Peter was always brave and bumbling at the same time, right? And and his example here actually, I think, shows us the constant danger that we face as followers of Christ, that we can either build the church or we can break the church. And so the question is, will you be a builder or a breaker? Because when we act like Peter did here, we're getting in the way of Jesus, thinking we know better. Will we rest our foundation on the wisdom of man We're on the unchanging, revolutionary, liberating power of the gospel found in this confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And my prayer today for you is that if you have not, that you would experience new life, that you would choose to follow him, that you would give your life to him, that you would fire the committee in your heart. My prayer is that you would build your life and that we would build our church on the only foundation that can withstand any storm that comes our way, the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, as we close, 
I want to share with you again about my house growing up. Because my dad and my uncle built this house in 1986, and, and I had the privilege of living there for many years. In fact, my mom sold it in 2013. After 26 years, 26 years after it was built, and we had many memories in that place. We had good times. We had, we had sad times. We had life-altering times. And that house was sturdy. But I'll never forget this home because, or I should say not because, it was the shelter during my growing up years, but because it was where I lived when the keys of the kingdom opened the door to me. I lived there when I discovered, when I truly discovered, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And my life was changed. And when the door was opened, I realized that I needed to build my life on a greater foundation than this earthly home gave me because this was just a shadow of things to come. And so I pray today that if you are not building your life on this better foundation of the person of Jesus Christ, that you would. I would impress on you one more time the words of my Father, the foundation has to be right. So... What is your foundation? I have to tell you, I've been through many storms in my life. And it kind of felt like this. It felt like somebody was pulling a hammer out. And they were trying to demolish my foundation. Storms would come, the enemy would attack, and this is what it sounded like in my heart. And if my life was built on a different foundation, it would have cracked, and my life would have been a pile of rubble. You see, when my father died, when the finances were tight, when I failed math in seventh grade, still not good at math, when the job offer didn't come through, when my friends let me down, when the relationship didn't work out, and one day when my health will fail me, this foundation built on the gospel has never and will never fail. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most secure, the most unshakable, the most unbreakable foundation we can build our life upon. Amen? Amen. Amen. What foundation are you building your life on?